The universal right to vote was the culmination of hundreds of years of small and large steps that resulted in a political culture where everyone, regardless of class, wealth, or gender, was able to vote. Our first guest tonight is Francis Fukuyama, senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford University. He's recently published the second volume of his opus on the history of political order. It's called Political Order and Political Decay, and we welcome Francis Fukuyama back to TVO. Professors, good to see you again. How are you doing tonight? Very good. Thanks very much for having me. I don't want to spoil the ending of your 548-page opus here, but let's just say it doesn't end on a very happy note. And let's start there. How do the forces, in your view, of decay in liberal democracies these days manifest themselves? Well, I think that decay uh, is really uh, a matter of two things. It's intellectual rigidity that doesn't allow you to adapt institutions when circumstances change. Uh, and then it's also the capture of the state by interest groups. The state is, a modern state is supposed to be impersonal. Uh, but there's a tendency over time for powerful elites to use their influence to manipulate the state. And uh, I don't think this is a feature just of democracies. I think virtually every political order that's existed in history uh, over time has been subject to this. And I think you can see some signs of this happening uh, in the contemporary United States with the rise of very powerful interest groups representing forces, for example, like the banking industry that have really uh, blocked, um, I think, beneficial public policies because uh, they can't be dislodged uh, in, in, in terms of their political power. If I understand properly, the decay that you write about mostly deals with public institutions, but I wonder whether you see signs of that decay as well in industry or private business. Well, actually, I think the American private sector is doing extremely well. The United States is really the only advanced industrial country that's growing uh, you know, in a, at a very healthy clip. And there's a lot of, you know, I live in Silicon Valley, uh, in the IT industry, in uh, energy, and a lot of other sectors. There's been a huge amount of uh, innovation. And so, you know, I think that we worry about moral decay and whether our children really have the right values. But uh, in many respects, I think American society is, is, is doing quite well. I think America's problems really have more to do with its political system and the particular way that the society interacts with those institutions. To that end, let me read the following excerpt from your book and share it with our viewers. If there has been a single problem facing contemporary democracies, either aspiring or well-established, it has been centered in their failure to provide the substance of what people want from government. Personal security, shared economic growth, and quality basic public services like education, health, and infrastructure that are needed to achieve individual opportunity. So just to be clear about this, safety, health care, a good education system, but not freedom? Well, I think we take freedom for granted. Um, a, a government, a, a modern political system, in my view, has to have really three institutions. It needs a state, which is really about power, which is the ability to actually provide those kinds of services and security and so forth. But that power needs to be constrained by two other institutions, one of which is the rule of law uh, and the other of which is democratic accountability. And so I think that uh, an important, um, I mean, a, a just system and a well-functioning system is really a balance of forces that are not necessarily compatible or, or fully harm, uh, in harmony with one another. So if you have too much state and not enough law and democratic accountability, you get a dictatorship. Uh, and if you have too much uh, constraint uh, and not enough state, you get a state that doesn't provide those basic uh, services that people want out of government. And so you really need to be somewhere in the, in the middle. And where is that balance in the United States of America today, in your view? Well, I think that historically, the American system came out of a revolt against British monarchical power. And we've always emphasized law and democracy, the institutions of constraint uh, over uh, a state. In fact, the first effort to create the United States was the Articles of Confederation that created such a weak body that we had to have a constitutional convention that provided the kind of executive authority that ex exists in the United States now. But our political culture is really on the constraint side. We want freedom. And I think, in a, you know, despite a lot of Republicans worrying about uh, Obama being a dictator, we live in probably one of the freest uh, societies uh, in, in human history. But on the 
stateside, uh, I think there have been a number of failings. Uh, you know, Congress hasn't been able to pass budgets because of polarization and uh, deadlock. Uh, you know, services work much better than in a developing country, but they could work much, much better uh, than they do. And I think that's what is bothering Americans, plus this feeling that you see uh, among the populist, uh, you know, certain populist voices that there are a lot of shadow elites, elites that are out there manipulating the system to their uh, own benefit. And I think that down the road is not uh, healthy for the legitimacy of the system. Okay, I just want to make sure I understand the emphasis though, because of course from north of the border, we see an America in Canada that is heavily focused on freedom and then whatever, you know, security and well-being and so on, that comes later. Are you saying that it's the other way around right now, that actually... No, 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 I'm, no you got it, <laughs> you've got it exactly right. My, one of my uh, dear mentors, uh, Seymour Martin Lipset, that wrote uh, extensively on Canada, said that that's exactly the, the, the um, difference between Canada and the United States, that Canada has much more respect for the state, much more respect for order. Uh, it cares about uh, law and democracy as well, but it gets them in you know, much more of a balance, whereas the United States has always de-emphasized the executive branch and state authority uh, and built up the uh, institutions of constraint, law and democracy. And I think that explains the difference between the two societies completely. Is it the case now that JFK's memorable inaugural, where we ask not what your country can do for you, but rather what you can do for your country, um, is not really how democracy works anymore? Well, I think the, the culture has changed. So JFK may have set, you know, issued that stirring call to public service, but Ronald Reagan began his presidency by saying, government is not the solution, government is part of the problem. And I think ever since the early 1980s, we've been in a phase, a very anti-government phase, uh, whose apotheosis really now is the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party that uh, is actively hostile really to government itself. Now this is a long-standing tradition in the United States, but we've gone back and forth in this. And I think for much of the 20th century up until the Reagan revolution, public service and public interest were, were held to be uh, you know, very important values, but I think there's been a denigration of them uh, ever since that time, and we're still living in a period where, you know, very few students, very few of my students really want to go into government. They all want to go into the private sector or into non-governmental organizations, but somehow the allure of public service has diminished, and so I think that's, you know, that's a real problem for us. We do notice that a lot these days. People of ability don't seem to want to go into public service anymore. They much prefer private business. Um, do you think that phenomenon is new? Well, it is, yeah, definitely. So when I was a student back in the 1960s, uh, anybody, uh, in early 70s, anybody that wanted to go to business school or become a corporate lawyer or have anything to do with the private sector was regarded as morally somehow uh, suspect that what you wanted to do was was much more publicly oriented uh, and I think that that all changed with the economic security of the oil crisis and the subsequent turmoil and I think these days uh, it's the case that if you want to get a job you know you really have to focus and, 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 and focus on the private sector now compared to countries in which the government is the only route to getting rich I'd much prefer the American system I think the reason that we have freedom and a pretty good and a very healthy private sector uh, is that ambitious young people want to make a fortune in Silicon Valley or you know, uh, other places. But I do think that it means that the quality of government in this country is less than it could be because uh, there has been this, you know, in a way, distaste for uh, government that has been particularly pronounced since the 1980s. Hmm. Let's go back a bit to first principles here, and again, I want to return to that three-legged stool you talked about, the state, the law, and democratic accountability. Uh, I suppose we in the West, in Western democracies, like to think that we have, uh, in spite of the criticisms that you have in your most recent book, uh, that we have the best way of organizing society and living in the world. Do you think that it was inevitable that that three-legged stool would come together and that Western democracies would exist? Well, actually, I think that's one of the big um, 
uh, underlying points of, of these two books that I've written is that it wasn't inevitable and that it actually proceeded from a certain kind of historical accident. So, for example, the origins of parliamentary government lie in the fact that there was one country in Europe, England, in which the fight between the king representing the state and the parliament uh, representing the forces of accountability were fairly evenly balanced. They fought a civil war, they beheaded one king and they deposed another, and the result was a constitutional settlement that's really the basis for modern uh, parliamentary uh, constitutional government today. And that didn't happen in France, it didn't happen in Spain, it didn't happen in Russia, uh, simply because the historical circumstances were different. So I do think that there is a fair amount of luck and accident in human history, which means that you know, none of these political forms is, is necessarily inevitable. So that's the explanation as to why some countries do develop these uh, you know, democratic, liberal democratic institutions and others don't. It, it, I mean, some of it's luck and some of it's what else? Well, I, I don't think it's purely luck because the formula of a balanced uh, state that had a strong state but was also constrained, especially by law that protected things like property rights, turned out to be a tremendous platform for capitalist economic development. And so uh, first England and then the United States that had systems built around these uh, kinds of political institutions took off. They were the first to industrialize. And a lot of other countries looked at this and saw that if they wanted to get rich uh, as well, they would have to protect property rights. They would have to uh, ensure a, 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 a certain substantial degree of individual freedom. And that's why the, United, the, the world has gone from about 35 uh, democracies back in 1970 to something like 100, 115 uh, in 2015. And so the model may be accidental when it starts out, but I think that people emulate success uh, and, and they want to copy things that look like they're successful. So it's not a completely random uh, uh, series of events. Understood. I guess the first time I met you on television, as it were, was back in 1989. We did an interview about your very famous essay, The End of History, in which you argue that liberal democracy sort of represents the, uh, the highest and best form of organizing society. And I wonder whether, I wonder whether the arguments you've now put forward and your analysis of the decay that we are now experiencing in Western democracies has changed your thinking about whether or not we are, in fact, still the best? Well, I think normatively, I absolutely believe that. And I think in the long run, societies that really want to be modern and prosperous uh, and, and stable need this combination of state, law, and accountability. But I guess where I've changed my views in the 25 years since I wrote that, um, uh, The End of History, uh, first, I appreciate much better how difficult it is to create modern institutions, and particularly modern state institutions, impersonal uh, bureaucratic states. Uh, and then I would say that the theme of political decay is one that I had not been particularly uh, uh, aware of or, or, or thought much about uh, 25 years ago. But you know, I think that reflects uh, developments that have happened since then, because I do think that the American system you know, doesn't look as attractive today as it did 25 years ago, although I think it still has some very important strengths. Well, let's give a concrete example here of a society that you do think is very attractive and perhaps ought to be emulated, and, and that was Denmark. Uh, you talk about Denmark as being uh, sort of the good society of the world today, and I wonder whether you think sort of small, ethnically homogeneous societies in the Northern Hemisphere are the best <laughs> examples for other countries around the world to follow. Well, you know, Denmark is just a, it's just a symbol for a country that is well governed and probably the most important thing about it is that it has vanishingly low levels of political corruption. Corruption is one of those um, uh, deficiencies in modern, in, in modern government that is probably the most pervasive and it's also probably the, the one that's hardest to eradicate. And so I think, yes, Denmark is uh, exceptional in the sense that it's very small. It, it up till now has been relatively homogeneous. It too is the product of a number of historical uh, accidents. And so it's not something that can be easily emulated. But I think as a target or as an ideal type, that's why I, I talk about it. Somebody who reviewed your book raised the following question. 
What if large sections of humanity don't much care about getting to Denmark? What's your answer for that? Well, I think it's clear that there are important parts of the world that don't care about getting to Denmark. Uh, I think that development, however, is something, you know, the, the desire for democracy obviously didn't exist in all periods of human history. It's only a couple hundred years old in the places where it's gotten established. But I think that it's something that appears over time as a result of economic and social growth. Uh, when you have a broader middle class that's well educated, that is connected with the outside world, they own property that can be taken away by the state. Uh, I think there's a universal demand for greater political participation and you can see this really uh, going on in many countries around the world. It's not a guarantee that democracy will appear, but I do think that it's not culturally determined. Uh, and, and you've seen this in, in you know, quite a lot of very culturally different parts of the world. Okay, Professor Fukuyama, we're going to continue our exploration of how democracies function or not, and why it is that in some parts of the world, words such as democracy and freedom conjure up images of chaos decadence and disarray. So, joining us now, in Moscow, Russia, via Skype, here's Alexander Dugan. He's a Russian philosopher and political activist. His most recent book is called Eurasian Mission, an introduction to neo-Eurasianism. And joining us in Klagenfurt, Austria, via Skype, there's Ivan Krastyev, chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, Bulgaria. He's a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, Austria. And his most recent book is called Democracy Disrupted, The Politics of Global Protest. And we welcome our two other gentlemen to our program tonight. Ivan Krastyev, I'd like to start with you. Do you recognize in the protests that you have studied for your own work elements of the institutional kind of decay that uh, Professor Fukuyama is describing in his new book? Yes, I'll agree, because I do believe one of the most important things about democracy and any political regime, this is the capacity of self-correction. You cannot expect that political regimes are always going to develop upwards. They're always going to be crises. They're going to be declined. But the basic problem is, do you have a capacity to learn from your mistakes? And I do believe one of the interesting stories which we see today, and I do believe it has a lot to do with uh, the problem of governing these days, is that... Uh, Never in the world before it was so easy to get power and to lose power, but it is so difficult to govern. And part of the protest that we saw in the last five years, and by the way, in the last five years, in more than 70 countries in the world, both democracies and non-democracies, we have these very powerful popular protest movements, most of them not being organized by political parties or by trade unions. And what is important about these movements was very strong anti-institutional ethos. These people are not interested to be power. In a certain way, for them, the most important was to be critics of power. And I do believe this has something to do with the problem of difficulty of state building and governing, which Professor Fukuyama was talking about. Let me share an excerpt from your most recent book, Democracy Disrupted. You say the following, where governments are less powerful than before, corporations are more mobile and political parties bereft of the capacity to build a political identity around visions for the future. The power of citizens derives from their ability to disrupt, echoing very much what you just said. I want to ask about the importance of the so-called vision thing, as George Bush the father used to call it when he was president of the United States. Do you think the absence of a vision is creating conditions of civic unrest? I do believe, because this is the problem of political loyalty. Uh, in his, in my view, great book, Exit, Voice, and Loyalty, some decades ago, Albert Hirschman was making the major distinctions between the way we react to dissatisfaction in the field of politics compared to the field of market. He said, when you don't like a certain commercial product, you st simply stop buying it. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to politics, exit is not the only option. If you are really loyal, basically, if you share a vision, if you have a loyalty to the community, you are not simply leaving the country, you are not simply leaving the political party, you are trying to change it. And I do believe from this point of view, vision is clearly important because vision creates identities. And from this point of view, some of the new protest movements which we're talking about were quite weak and creating political identities which are going to survive more than the time that we have been together on the square. All right, vision is one thing, but we also hear a lot talked about these days about greater transparency. Do you think if we had 
political institutions that were more transparent to their citizens, that would enhance the trust we have in them. Listen, transparency is very important, and this is part of the problem of the accountability that Professor Fukuyama talks about. But I do believe that we are slightly moving in an extreme direction, basically trying to believe that transparency is going to be the solution of all problems. Don't forget that democracy started not with transparency, but with secrecy. It was the secret vote that empowers the people. And I do believe that uh, the very fact that you believe that certain decisions are going to be transparent does not mean that these decisions are going to be fair, that these decisions are going uh, to be good. Uh, and uh, in my view, at least, transparency could be an instrument for good politics, but I don't see the transparent as a goal. And from this point of view, I'm not sharing some of this obsession and some of this belief that transparency is the answer to all the questions that we see. Uh, not Knowing everything basically does not mean that we are going to agree on the same thing. So from this point of view, I don't believe that transparency is enough. Okay. Alexander Dugan, as we welcome you into this conversation now, I wonder if we could start by having you tell us what your perception at the moment is of Western democracies as described by our other two guests. Uh, my vision uh, is much more critical than previous uh, guests. Um, because I think that we are dealing now not with technical, uh, but philosophical or metaphysical problem. So the problem of the crisis of democracy lays, uh, as long as I see, in the incapacity of the West, of the Western civilization, to understand the positive other. Uh, the West is dealing only with negative vision of other. Other or is the same as ourself or is the lesser. So it is based on kind of messianic uh, conception of universalism of uh, Western civilization where we, uh, the West has uh, constructed liberal democracy that maybe fits to the Western culture, Western history, maybe not. It's up to Western uh, citizens to judge um, up to uh, which uh, point uh, this is suitable for uh, them. But uh, all that is based on the absolutely racist premise uh, about universalism of the Western system of values. So democracy we are dealing with is Western democracy that uh, conceives a, uh, all humanity to be a kind of imitation of the same or less than uh, Western type. But we are dealing with different cultures, with, with different humanities. There is no, not only one humanity, humanity uh, of the type of Western uh, civilization. Well, we have different cultures and different civilizations in plural and different humanities. And democracy should be adapted uh, to the identities, different identities, uh, that should be taken positively and not negatively. So I think now the protest against the West and the feeling of the decay of the Western democracy that I share with Mr. Fukuyama, basing on a completely different approach, I think that it is a common, uh, common feelings, uh, common sentiments uh, of uh, different cultures and people, but that is a kind of demand of profound, deep decolonization, uh, deep devasternization. There are many positive um, aspects in the West, but the one thing that everybody in the world, except maybe the West itself, uh, hates, it is the way of imposing the values as something universal. So I think that th this time it is a kind of lesson uh, to, um, uh, to teach to the West, uh, to the Western civilization, that there can be exists that there can be positive other that shouldn't be judged by uh, the western patterns and should be a knowledge acknowledged as something other that doesn't uh, uh, is the same uh, or, or lesser or worse than uh, the western culture but it's simply different this 
positive difference. It is demand of deep decolonization, a deep devastation of the people. So we consider um, that, that there is not only one type of democracy, Anglo-Saxon, uh, as uh, Mr. Fukuyama has explained um, brilliantly. So it was historic experience. Uh, Western democracy uh, has its own place in the history of England, of United States of America, in the history of Western Europe. But it is regional, a local phenomenon, historically and geographically. All right, and there I is take the, your rest, point. the rest that is against the West. Uh, as um, Huntington said. So we are the rest. Russia now is the vanguard of the rest that contests, that uh, challenge this universalism, this messianism of the West. We insist on other understanding of democracy. And I think that is precisely the most important problem in debates of the future. Now, I understand what you're saying, and I take your point, but at the beginning of your answer, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask Francis Fukuyama to comment on what you just said in a second, but you used a word that is a, it is a serious trigger word in Western democracies. You used the word racist in describing how people in the West sometimes view their version of democracy compared to others. Could you just amplify on what you meant by using that word in that context? So, uh, that very important scholar of England, uh, John Hobson, the specialist in international relations, explained in his brilliant book concerning Eurocentric vision of world politics, uh, what is precisely the basis of subliminal racism of the Western civilization. In the um, 19th uh, century, that was based uh, on the equation between white race and civilization, uh, uh, yellow race and barbarism uh, and uh, black uh, race as, as savage, savages. But uh, after uh, the uh, criminal experience of the Hitler, uh, Hitler in uh, Germany, um, this equation with the racist aspect biologically was um, put aside. But the same um, uh, structure of understanding the hierarchy of the cultures of the civilization rested in this place. And the West continue to understand the situation in the world, in the world politics, on the same basis. There is civilization, that is the West. There is the Barbary, that is, for example, Russia, China, or other uh, uh, BRICS, uh, BRICS uh, country. And there is also savages, the, the third, third world, uh, where there is no uh, emerging uh, uh, industrial countries, but uh, the kind of uh, the primitive, primitive way of living. All that is based on the presumption of kind of hierarchy between the society that was explicitly racist in the past and now it is implicitly or um, subliminal uh, racist, subliminally racist. But I think that that is the problem. You need to, uh, being real democrats, you need to put aside this universalism and try to understand why, for example, some tribes that don't want to uh, go in the same sense of development as Marcel Moss has shown, that there is a kind of, um, uh, of uh, rejection, uh, refuse uh, to the progress, to the accumulation of the goods by some archaic tribes. And that is decision that we need to take seriously if we are not racist. So I think that the problem of the biological racism is resolved in the West, but cultural racism, racism still exists, and it is precisely in the core of the Western thought and the Western geopolitics, Western strategy, Western set of values. And I think that we need to stop that. It is not democratic, democratic hmm. enough. Francis Fukuyama, I, I suspect there are many in the West who would plead guilty to feeling that we have the best system of government and organizing society in the history of the world. Uh, but I'm not sure I've ever heard the word racist used in the past to describe it. And I wonder what you think of Alexander Dugan's use of that word to describe uh, perhaps a Western sense of arrogance that we're doing it better than everybody else. Well, I think 
Mr. Dugan is right, historically there was you know, a, a racist component to especially the imperial policies of many European powers, but I think it's ridiculous to say that that's the, somehow the essence of a modern liberal democracy. Uh, the essence of liberalism is tolerance. Uh, liberalism grew out of the religious wars in Europe in the 16th, 17th century. They were very bloody and there's a recognition that if you have a society that's divided, at that time it was a religious divide, but it could be a racial divide, it could be an ethnic divide. There are many ways that societies are fractured, that the only real solution to this was a society in which people put aside these contestations over ultimate ends and agreed to live under a framework of law. And that's why I think liberal democracy really is universal because in some sense nobody lives in a homogeneous you know, society with one uh, culture, not the Chinese, not the Russians, not anybody. I mean, there's a diversity of people that live in these um, places. They have to be governed in a way that they can mutually coexist. And so I think liberal democracy was actually a functional adaptation to the need to deal with diversity. And in fact, I think liberal societies are the ones that have dealt with the problem of race and ethnic division the most successfully, precisely because their core value is tolerance. And that, I think, is, so it's not universal in the sense that there are many intolerant uh, societies around the world, but in the end, because of the de facto diversity of societies, I think you have to work your way to some institutionalized system that allows these different people to live together peacefully. But I think if I understood his point, it, it wasn't so much that in terms of race or ethnicity, we haven't made great strides on the issue of tolerance. It was in systems of government or in kind of democratic values that he feels the West is, using his word, racist and intolerant of other forms of democratic values around the world. Does he have a point at all there? Well, I think that you know, the behavior of the American foreign policy has been overbearing and arrogant in you know, many particular uh, circumstances, and you know, I, I would share that uh, critique, but the deeper issue about whether there are, in fact, uh, values that, if not universal today, deserve to be universal because they answer to fundamental shared human needs, I think there's no question that there are such uh, values in institutions because ultimately, uh, I don't think that culture overrides uh, certain basic characteristics of human personality that are uh, that transcend uh, culture. And that's what a political system tries to do. It, it has to be built on a, on a basis, uh, ultimately, of uh, a kind of shared uh, human identity. And so I think that's the part that's missing from Mr. Dugan's account. Hmm. Ivan Krastyev, where do you come down on this? Uh, also, my feeling is that basically Mr. Dugan's claim is that universalism means simply that uh, Western institutions should be imposed on others. Uh, and here I agree there is no one model and nobody can simply impose his model. But if we are not going to agree that there is universal human values, this is very difficult for us to treat each other as equal human beings. I do believe it is universalism that makes us equal. And from this point of view, of course, democracy can come from different sources and Indian democracy is based on a totally different experience. And on totally different practices and even institutions than the American one. But it does not mean that liberalism should basically refuse to be universalist in order to fit this new reality. I do believe we're much more going to renegotiate what universalism means. Because if we're going to agree that we're simply different, that we're different civilizations and so on, several interesting questions come up. For example, there are people in Russia that believe that they're part of the European civilization, that others who believe that they're part of the Eurasian civilization. How we're going to solve this? How we're going to, this, this is the same everywhere. How we're going to solve basically the pluralistic nature of our own societies. And from this point of view, I don't believe that criticism against the universal nature of democracy as such can be equal to basically the idea of promoting democracy and so on. And some of these practices, of course, can be very legitimately uh, criticized. So let me ask Alexander Dugan to respond by asking what, what is it about liberal, liberal democratic ideas as practiced in the West that you find incompatible with Russian culture and history? First of all, uh, precisely, uh, the, um, the, the most uh, essential thing was said now by Mr. Fuk Fukuyama. He 
uh, thinks, as well as the many of liberals, any liberal, that human nature is the same, that human nature transcends uh, cultures, and when they uh, are speaking about these universal, transcendental human nature that transcends cultures, uh, cultures, they think or about their understanding of the human. So that is the problem of anthropology, the Western anthropology, and above all, uh, Anglo-Saxon anthropology is based on the concept of the human being as individual as a positive individual with fully autonomous or partly autonomous content. But Russian uh, anthropology or Islamic anthropology or Indian anthropology or Chinese anthropology are absolutely different. For us, for us Russians, the human, to be human, it is the same uh, as to belong to the whole to the whole as uh, some, some integrality, to some, um, uh, for us, the man is not only individual, but is uh, a kind of collectivity, or um, that could be tra 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 translated as uh, um, society, or um, people, or church, or maybe state, but it is, holistic anthropology that serves to us as measure of things. For us also, the man is a measure of things, but not individual man. And when we are dealing with liberalism that is based on completely different anthropological uh, theory, now we, uh, we, we should react. We uh, understand human, uh, to be human differently from the West. And we, we want to affirm and to defend our understanding of human nature that is our historically, religiously, culturally, and for example, coming into modernity, uh, Russia preferred communism uh, and not liberalism, precisely because that we understand human nature differently, that is kind of holistic vision. So now we are uh, not anymore communist, we are not uh, um, tsarist regime, but we uh, are the same, we are Russians as always, we have been, so we are anthropologically holistic. So our understanding of human nature is incompatible with liberalism, and with Western, Anglo-Saxon above all, a system of values. Let me and follow up on that if I can. Let me follow up on that because uh, you know, my understanding of human nature is people want a job, a friend, a home. They want to be part of a family. Uh, how, I, is that not what Russian Canadian. people want? Because you are Canadian, because you are part of uh, Western, Anglo-Saxon, uh, of Western European civilization, you, uh, your measure is individual one, to have good job, good friends, good family, uh, liberty or freedom or justice and so on. But for us, Russian, there is something other that really is ma ma much more important, is the inner sense of um, uh, uh, belonging to the uh, just uh, system of uh, the of the world to the world harmony the, this harmony is not only spiritual it is also social cultural uh, political and f for us it is very important also the other understood as a part of the whole not only a particular and isolated human being uh, aside so it is completely different ontological and anthropological basis for our society. And uh, we also, we are Russians, we, we have friends, uh, we, um, we, we are bothering about good job and work. But for us, there is something that is much more important. Before, it was conceived in the sense of religion, in the sense of um, loyalty uh, to the Orthodox Church. After that, that was communism. And now, we are calling that Eurasian, Eurasian civilization. So it is a kind of feeling 
to belong to something that transcends our individuality and that is much more important than it. That is our answer, historical experience and system of values defended by our uh, writers, by Dostoevsky, by, by Tolstoy, uh, by every, every serious figure in our uh, culture, in our literature, in our art, uh, uh, all uh, of them uh, were uh, for, uh, on, in one or other form defenders of this uh, particularity of Russian culture and expressed uh, uh, this in different manners. Okay, let me get Francis Fukuyama to react to that. Uh, perhaps we're all very different because human nature is not the same. Is he right about that? Well, first of all, Mr. Dugan is not talking about different anthropologies. I mean, if there's a human nature, it's universal. That's the definition of human nature. It's a biologically given thing. What he's basically saying is that Russians are culturally different. Their culture is not as individualistic as Western culture. That is true historically, but it also assumes that cultures are these unchanging monolithic uh, entities that somehow uh, are transmitted across generations and never change. I mean, there was a time uh, when Western societies were far less individualistic. They, people were loyal to tribes at one point, and then they became loyal to uh, larger collective uh, units. And individualism uh, is something that evolved, I think, uh, in part out of the necessity of running a modern capitalist society, which uh, in a market economy, you know, in a sense, needs a, a greater degree of uh, mobility social mobility and if you're tied down by kinship ties or by uh, ties uh, in which the state dictates uh, the kind of occupation you can work in uh, a modern economy is not going to work and so in a way individualism was a response to the functional needs of a society Russia is no different Russia is cha I mean Mr. Dugan acts as if all Russians think like him uh, but in fact there's a lot of uh, variety of opinion and there's a modern part of Russian society that actually wants to be a liberal society like uh, you know, the, the European Union. And that, uh, so these things are all changeable over time. And, and that's why I think the issue is, is political development. You know, societies never stay the same. Uh, they're never anchored in a single culture. And unless they are able to adapt to those no, new social realities, they're gonna fail. I'm intrigued as to where uh, Ivan Krastyev comes down on this issue because uh, as a Bulgarian, I think you share the Cyrillic alphabet that uh, Russia has and you also share the Eastern Orthodox Church that Russia has. So where are you on this? We not only share, we basically invented the alphabet. Uh, but uh, uh, no, I do believe uh, this is the major issue. I will agree very much with Mr. Dugin that culture matters that people are shaped by their experiences and by their historical experiences. But he's talking about this type of a cultural identity as if it is not contested within its own society. He named Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, but if you can make, name Pushkin and Herzen, you're going to see that what it means to be Russian was a question that had been very differently answered within Russian society. And he told you that you talk what you are talking because you're Canadian. But listen, there are not many Canadians 300 years ago probably you're coming from somewhere. And for example, all these Russians who are living now in different parts of the world, are they a part of this same communitarian culture? Or to what extent they're more individualistic? So I'm going to agree with Francis Fukuyama on the fact that cultures change. And by the way, cult cultures change by institutions, by the level of economic developments, they change by what's happening uh, to them. As a result of it, of course, Russia's idea of good society is going to be different probably than the idea of the good society of the United States. But it does not mean that when a Russian dies or Bulgarian dies and somebody is going to have an autopsy, we are going to find a different uh, biological being. Uh, Mr. Dugan, let me get you to follow up with this then. If, um, if the Russian people were raised rather than on the values that you have uh, ascribed so far in our program, but rather following liberal values like universal human rights and gender equality and minority rights, how would Russia be different? So, well, first of all, I, um, I think that, um, I agree that uh, the cultures change, but uh, we need to identify uh, why, what are the motivation and the sources of uh, this, these changes. 
and first of all, I think that uh, every culture uh, has its proper kind of development. So, uh, Russian uh, development of, of was almost always centered around this uh, holistic anthropology. So, we had a certain part of pro-Western uh, and uh, liberal elite always in the 90, in the uh, 20 and now, but that was always the minority, maybe important minority, culturally or intellectually, but always minority because the majority of our population, including in the um, question of change, uh, the uh, majority prefers uh, um, ca to conserve our identity, developing it, and uh, conserve much important things uh, think in it. So this uh, feeling of uh, you, uh, kind of cosmic sense of the whole, that was precisely uh, that was disintegrated in the beginning of the Western modernity. So we, uh, if we, for example, we could choose freely without imposition uh, or hegemony of the West, I am absolutely sure that we would uh, choose uh, some development uh, and change basing uh, on our proper cultural identity. So we, uh, we are changing, but not necessarily in the sense of the Western civilization. Okay. There is very good, very good um, uh, term proposed by Huntington, modernization without Westernization. That is, it is our case. We are going into the future. We are not uh, obliged to be always uh, in the past. But our future is different. It is a Russian future, future based on Russian uh, values. And no, I understand that. Post. I understand, but I'm wondering what would be different about Russia or what would Russia lose if rather than the values Russians are raised on today, they were raised on values of minority rights, gender equality, universal human rights, etc. Because that all contradicts to our values. For us, family is something sacred. The uh, relations between man and woman are not only natural, but spiritually and culturally founded. So the idea of the uh, egoism, positive or enlightened or, or, or other uh, are completely rejected by our society. So liberal agenda goes against our identity. So we could impose that. We could try to change our society. But sooner or later, there will be, there will be the kind of revolt against that, not, uh, because, not imposed by uh, dictatorship or uh, ruling class. That will be a revolt uh, from inside, from the depth of our uh, culture. And this, in this situation, I think that uh, we could be obliged to accept liberal values, but sooner or later we, we will protest against them and uh, we will overthrow the system based on them. Francis Fukuyama, it doesn't sound to me like Alexander Dugan wants to be like Denmark. What do you have to say to him about that? Well, it's interesting, you know. Uh, actually, as far as I can tell, the main thing that he's got against contemporary Western liberalism is gay marriage. Well, that's part uh, of it, to be sure. Kind of at the forefront of the liberal uh, agenda, uh, but I wouldn't be as sure as him that Russians will never accept something like that because you just look at what the West. You know, 15, 20 years ago, nobody accepted uh, gay marriage. It was you know not talked about and it, it was swept under the table, and there's just been this unbelievable shift in popular opinion, and especially if you look by age, uh, people under the age of 30 have absolutely no objection to it, where, whereas there's a lot of resistance uh, in, in, in older generations. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if Russia went through a similar kind of uh, transformation that the state might try to slow down or stop, but it's something that happens spontaneously. So I, I just think that, you know, these assertions, these confident assertions that Russian culture is always this and it will always oppose a certain thing, just don't have a, a basis in, in empirical fact. 
Okay, let me move on to the question of whether Europe is today what it was, say, 25 years ago, when we used to read a lot of books saying we should be more like Europe. Europe's got it right. And to that end, Ivan Krastyev, let me bring you in first. Uh, there are a lot of things happening in Europe these days that are scaring a lot of people. And let's start, for example, in Hungary. What's your view on what's taking place in that Eastern European nation? Now listen, uh, as I have been saying before, you have globalization and of course you have a backlash against globalization. In Europe, you have a societies that have been changing very much. I mean, culturally, politically. Uh, when I was uh, listening uh, to, to Mr. Dugin and he's telling how conservative Russian society it is, probably this is on the level of theory. But if you see, for example, the level of abortions, or divorces, uh, you're going to see that basically Russians, who according to him are so close to family and so much respect family, are divorcing much more than Europeans. Uh, basically, you're going to see that you have a much more abortions in Russia compared to Europe. Uh, but where I am going to agree with him is that all these type of uh, changes within the societies, they're not just going in one direction. Basically, Hungarians, uh, have been disappointed by the results of the transition. Uh, they basically are facing, in my view, a kind of an interesting dilemma. This is a very small, homogeneous societies, which was very much traumatized uh, after the end of the World War I. And basically, they very much believe, and this is what Mr. Orban uh, openly said, there is this illiberal uh, uh, values, this is this illiberal model, which is not so much based on the idea of the super consensus, uh, that is typical for the European societies today, but is much more about supermajority. We should consolidate the nation. The problem is that it's much easier to be said than to be done. Because what is important about Europe these days is that we are not simply 28 states. We are so much moving amongst each other. We are so much basically meeting each other. And nevertheless, that all of us, Bulgarians, Hungarians, and others, we have certain reservation against the cultural changes that are happening. We have the feeling that we're losing things, by the way, the warmness of the community. I don't believe that Hungary is an alternative to anything that is going to happen to Europe. Uh, because strangely enough, what has happened in the European politics in the last 25 years is that to a certain extent, economic decision making was taken out of the electoral politics. You have basically in the world, in my view now, two types of regime. Both of them claim that there is no alternative, but in Europe you don't have a policy alternative. So people can change governments, but they don't change much economic politics because they constitutionalize on the level of the European Union. In places like Russia and China, basically, it's much easier to change policies. It's much more difficult to change those in power. And I do believe this type of attention is very much the result of the globalization. And we all are part of this global process. And I very much uh, uh, understand understand uh, the sentiments from which uh, Mr. Dugin is coming, but this revolt against globalization, in my view, is logical, but it is not easy to succeed, exactly because we are much more mixed than ever before, because our societies are much more contested. And this is Hungary, and this you can see in many other places. In the case of Hungary, simply it's much more visible. I do believe that Europe is not the Europe of 50 years ago, and many of the things that have been perceived as a traditional European values and not what, what we see today, but let's just give you one uh, figure which could be interesting for you. I have been watching, the, uh, basically seeing the results of the opinion polls concerning the same-sex marriage. And do you know, the difference between nations and not the real one. The real one is the difference between generations. People younger than 35 basically don't have a problem in their majority with the same-sex marriage in all European countries. Even in but Russia? There is one issue. Uh, I'm talking about European Union. European but there Union, is okay. only one issue on which you are not going to see a difference between generations, and this is the rejection of immigration. So if I do believe that there are going to be a major problem which Europe is going to face, it's not going to be so much on the level of uh, uh, gender. Uh, it's going to be much more on the problem of the immigration. Uh, Francis Fukuyama, perhaps uh, I could get you to comment on the comments of Hungary's Prime Minister, uh, Viktor Orban, who recently said, we don't believe that every democracy is necessarily liberal. you find that concerning? Oh, it's very concerning. I think it's especially concerning because Hungary was the first former Warsaw Pact country to really make what seemed to be a full transition to being a real European uh, liberal democracy. And because that transition seemed to be so quick and easy, I think everybody assumed that it was a, 
a done deal for all time. Uh, and so it's very significant that Hungary of all, I mean, if, uh, you know, if other parts of Eastern Europe slid backwards, people would be less surprised. But the fact that Hungary is doing that, uh, I think, is taken as a very bad uh, sign. I think Mr. Orban, um, in a way, uh, is going to have a lot of problems running a, a, an illiberal democracy uh, because, uh, as uh, Ivan Krastev said, you know, that globalization has meant that you just need a degree of pluralism and interconnection with the rest of the world that, uh, that, that really requires a, a liberal society as, as an underpinning. Uh, but there's no question that, you know, in many respects, uh, he does represent this kind of more rural, less educated part of the Hungarian population whose lives have been, in a way, threatened, their livelihoods have been threatened, and their lives have been disrupted by globalization. Uh, but they don't represent the more, uh, you know, the more modern part of Hungary. Well, there's also been a, a, quite an uptick in anti-Semitism in Hungary, the, the likes of which we haven't seen in, uh, well, got to be careful here. Let's say 60 or 70 years, we'll put it that way. Alexander Dugan, th there is a lot of concern in the West about what's happening in Hungary. Is there in Russia? So I think that uh, from my part, I think that Orban uh, is absolutely right. There could be different democracy, and it is not absolutely necessary to democracy to be democracy um, liberal. For example, there could be completely different democracy. There could be also uh, interconnection and. Uh, exchange of the values between the cultures, not basing on the uh, individualistic liberal uh, strategy. Uh, so I could presume, I could uh, um, imagine, for example, creation of greater Eastern Europe project with some uh, cultures, uh, Hungary and other people uh, joining to create a, uh, alternative Europe, for example, uh, with democracy, with openness to each other, recreating a kind of uh, maybe uh, past uh, form of living of Euro Eastern European people among each other without uh, nationalist conflict. But I think also that um, uh, these, uh, f f Mr. Fukuyama, um, uh, shows what I uh, 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 I was talking about concerning cultural racism. For example, uh, uh, to quali qualify Orban to be representative of peasantry, not modern enough to understand uh, liberal democracy, it is classical vision of hierarchy between not this time uh, ra uh, racial types in the um, in the biological sense but a kind of uh, social or professional or um, sociological uh, cultural racism because if uh, he is a representative of the peasantry, and that is majority of the, um, uh, at least the majority of the Hungarians thinking like him and supporting him. Uh, I think that Hungarian people is right, not uh, liberal theorists uh, uh, from United States or from Canada, from Russia, from elsewhere. So I think that is for Hungarians to decide what uh, man uh, uh, is better to represent uh, uh, the Hungary. And I think his support, as well as support, popular support for Putin, consists precisely not in uh, anti-democratic uh, form of ruling, but uh, in, the, um, in, that, uh, in the moment that they represent what majority maybe civilized or not civilized uh, uh, think and uh, like and want from uh, leaders. So I think it is not populism. It is a kind of to respond, uh, to answer uh, the, uh, the demands uh, of the people that 
doesn't coincide with uh, liberal democracy or the global West think they should be. So that is a reality check. So Hungarian people, uh, for me, for, from my, uh, for my opinion, sees better and understand better than I and then Mr. Fukuyama, what is the right man to rule Hungary. And I think that Orban expresses uh, the um, common opinion. Uh, so that is precisely democracy that doesn't fit in liberal, uh, in some way, totalitarian agenda. I should let Mr. Fukuyama respond to that if he wants to. Well, <laughs> It's very amusing to hear me uh, characterized as a racist. I thought that I was actually giving a kind of Marxist interpretation because I think a number of political forms are favored by certain social classes uh, more than others. And I think you know, that kind of basic Marxist sociology applies in many parts of Eastern Europe and in Russia, uh, uh, Russia itself. I mean, you know, the, the real question is not democracy. The question is liberalism. Uh, is it important to protect minorities and not let majorities just do whatever they want? Uh, that's been the essence of liberal democratic constitutional government really since the glorious revolution in England. And I think um, that's partly a value question, uh, but it's also, I think, a functional question because the fact of the matter is that we live in societies that have uh, minorities that are not going to go away. And if you don't respect them, uh, and if you don't protect their rights, if the state uh, doesn't think that it's important to protect their rights, uh, then there's going to be persecution. Uh, and so this is the path, uh, and, and Steve, you mentioned anti-Semitism in Hungary, but Hungary's got a terrible history uh, in the way that it treated its, uh, its Jewish population in the 1930s and uh, 40s. And by reviving that tradition, uh, it's very ominous for, uh, you know, for, for what's going to happen in that country in the future. Mm. Gentlemen, we've been chatting for quite a good pace of time so far, and somehow we have not yet mentioned the word Ukraine. But we will now, because this is a part of the world that we must discuss. Alexander Dugan, tell us, what does Vladimir Putin want? So, uh, Vladimir Putin wanted to have Ukraine as a neutral country uh, governed by democracy in the old sense. Democracy as the rule of majority. I understand that liberal democracy, it is the, the rule of minority against the majority. And um, in front of the fear to be persecuted uh, by majority, a minority begins to persecute majority. It is liberal understanding of uh, liberal democracy. And that is precisely uh, what, uh, what uh, has happened in Ukraine. That war was, there was a kind of coup d'etat uh, overthrowing democratically uh, um, elected, uh, elected President Yanukovych. Uh, and after uh, that, uh, that was a kind of liberal, ultra-nationalist uh, government uh, uh, illegitimate uh, from our point of view that came to power. Uh, and that was a kind of civil war in Ukraine because the half of the population uh, in the east and, the, and in the south of Ukraine uh, refused to uh, accept the coup d'etat and uh, accept the legitimacy of the uh, new Kievan government. Uh, the Russia that is culturally and historically very close to this part of southern and eastern uh, Ukraine uh, came to, to help uh, them to uh, affirm their rights uh, to say no for, to this dictatorship. And that was uh, the essence of the conflict and the essence of the reunification with Crimea and the revolt in Donbass. And I think that uh, now we could not expect could not wait natural or, uh, or um, easy solution for that. Uh, so that was the reason, as uh, Russians understand uh, the situation, and I think that we are on the edge of the real, maybe global conflict, because Russia cannot accept 
uh, what um, uh, has happened in the Kyiv. Uh, Let me ask uh, a follow-up on that, if I can. Why, why cannot Russia accept a Ukraine that's not neutral? Uh, uh, because uh, uh, half of the population in the Ukraine is pro-Russian. And the government uh, of uh, Ukraine uh, is anti-Russian that uh, has, came, uh, has come to the power with the help of the West. So that is great reaction uh, inside of Russia and inside of Eastern and Southern Ukraine against such situation. So Russia could be some, um, the, the only pos possibility to uh, satisfy uh, this situation from our point of view is uh, creating in Ukraine uh, two countries democratically with, for example, eastern uh, part uh, governed by uh, democracy as a rule of majority and the um, western part uh, ruled by uh, western kind of liberal democracy. Could the so western the part of Ukraine, of, could the western part of Ukraine be part of NATO? Uh, that w will be against uh, historical tradition of this uh, of this uh, part of the Ukraine, but in the present situation, I think, I fear it is inevitable. Okay, let me go to Ivan Krastyev. Uh, we in the West really want to better understand wh where Russia is coming from on this issue. And could you tell us what you think Western Europeans and North Americans don't understand uh, about how Russia thinks about this issue uh, as it manifests itself in Ukraine? No, I do believe one of the things where I do believe that West was wrong and naive is, especially the European Union, never perceived itself as a threat. We believe that we are so nice and vegetarian that basically we cannot threaten anybody. So from this point of view, this was wrong. And also, Russians do, does not share Europeans' view that the end of the Cold War was a win-win situation. Many Russians, and here Mr. Putin speaks for the majority of the Russians, basically believes that... Uh, Russia was the loser and basically uh, it was mistreated in the post-Cold War period. But here comes the major story and it very much, I do believe it's interesting that we talked Hungary before we talk Ukraine. If Mr. Dugin believes that the majority has the right, this is true for the Hungarian majority, this is true for the Ukrainian majority too. And the biggest, at least my reading of the conflict is, it didn't start as a geopolitical clash between Russia and the European Union. People that have been on the streets, not the first uh, five or ten days, but later, there were much more reaction to the Yanukovych government and to the fact that force was used, and to basically to the corruption of the Ukrainian political elite, which cannot be confined only to Yanukovych. But the basic problem was that then, I do believe that Russia, with the annexation of Crimea, totally humiliated the Ukrainian nation. And what I saw, and for me, this is a very important division. Many in the West talk about Ukraine as if being divided between the Russian speakers and the Ukrainian speakers. I don't believe that this is the major divide these days. You're going to see these days, in my view, I find this is a tragic development. Many Russian speakers who do not speak Ukrainian and being very strongly uh, Ukrainian nationalists because they are de defending the identity of their state. And from this point of view, the problem is that either they are going to be the Ukraine, which is going to be tolerant to the minority and this Donbass and so on, and I do believe here basically we all are going to agree, or in a certain way, they are going to be somebody outside telling to the Ukrainians, listen, you cannot be anti-Russian, pro-Western, because this is not part of your anthropology, but it's an anthropology change. I was very kind of personally... Uh, hurt to see how high the level of anti-Russian sentiments is in the Russian-speaking places like Kiev. But this has a lot to do with the way now Russia is treating the Ukrainian conflict. And this is going to be a very, very difficult development because uh, I agree with Mr. Uh, Dugin that it's not simply Mr. Putin, that there is a very important Russian now uh, support uh, for what's happening in Donbass. But we can badly end up with destabilized Ukraine, but also very much destabilized Russia. And this is not going to be good for anybody. Uh, to use um, Ivan Krasyev's words, uh, Francis Fukuyama, we're not vegetarians in the West. Uh, we have a dog in this hunt. Uh, you pointed out earlier that when the West does engage in some areas geopolitically, it's often with tragic consequences and not well thought through. Do we need to, in your view, 
better understand where Russia is coming from on the issue of Ukraine? Well, certainly, I, I actually would agree uh, with what Yvonne said and, and Mr. Dugan that you know the United States made a lot of mistakes in its policy towards Russia and towards that uh, region in the lead up to this, but that does not justify uh, uh, Russia's actions. I, you know, I guess I differ from Mr. Dugan in the following sense that he would like to see this as a clash of, of you know, equally principled ideologies. I think that the real issue in Ukraine and ultimately the real issue in Russia is not a different set of values, it's corruption. The whole Ukrainian elite uh, was built, it was a kleptocracy. It was a regime that was in place to extract resources using state power for their own private benefit and in many respects that is exactly the same kind of system that Mr. Putin is running. They're both democratically elected, they have democratic legitimacy, but they are basically kleptocracies. And I think that what all the young protesters in Maidan Square were, were saying was, we don't want to live in that kind of country. We want to associate with the European Union because for us it represents a, a kind of modern state in which the state serves a public interest that is impersonal. You don't have to be a friend of Mr. Yanukovych or Mr. Putin uh, in order for your business to get ahead. And that's really the, you know, the, 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 the fundamental uh, values clash uh, that is going on there. Uh, and you know, I think that uh, in terms of how we deal with this uh, going down the road, I think uh, you know, the, the United States and the West uh, needs to support uh, that kind of government and, and just the principle that, uh, I, and I think here Ivan is completely right, that even in the Russian speaking areas, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that don't want to be associated with that form of political corruption and, and, and they deserve uh, support. Alexander Dugan, let's broaden the discussion beyond Ukraine. I note that you are advancing an idea of a Eurasian empire, which would include beyond Russia, Austria, Hungary, Romania, Serbia, and Slovakia. Help us understand what the idea is there. So never, uh, that is a kind of uh, accusation uh, recently. So never I have written the, the words concerning uh, necessity to include in a kind of Eurasian Empire um, the uh, Eastern European countries. It is it's ridiculous. Uh, in all my writings, um, I have spoken about uh, recreation, a great space, not necessary empire, not necessary uh, kind of uh, unitarian state, but something like uh, East, uh, European Union, uh, but on the uh, alternative um, uh, basis, uh, civilizational basis. And this uh, kind of um, uh, of the creation of Eurasian um, uh, supranational uh, organization or Eurasian Union, uh, I always consider to be in the borders of the <coughs> ancient uh, Russian Empire or Soviet Union or less. So that should be a unification of the people and countries with the common historic uh, experience, with common destiny, and based absolutely on the free will. So uh, Eastern Europe uh, represents completely different civilization, and above all, Austria and Hungary that uh, were never uh, part of uh, these Turanian, Turanian uh, civilizational construction that have maybe some common features with us, but they are completely different, and they were and they will be. So uh, it is completely not, uh, incorrect and uh, a, a little bit ridiculous to, um, uh, to uh, affirm um, the such uh, strange things that I have never said, as many commentators uh, um, are making uh, in the uh, last uh, last uh, time, accusing me for the um, opinion that I have never uh, emitted, never never defended. But uh, I think that um, Eastern Europe represent a kind of. Mm, uh, cultural and civilizational uh, space very particular and very different from 
uh, Western Europe. So Eastern Europe, uh, it is uh, a kind of um, um, civilizational region that uh, possesses very special features that are semi-Eurasian, uh, as uh, uh, Russian, for example, society, and semi-Western European. And uh, the, the, the example of the Hungarian or Greece, uh, also maybe of the Romania in, in the future, they uh, are showing that uh, they understanding of uh, the values of the society of uh, uh, the set of uh, the main principles are slightly or maybe not so slightly different from uh, European Union and the precisely the fact that Hungary was the first country that accomplished full transition to liberal democracy and that now it is the first country to take uh, distances from this uh, liberal democracy is the symbol of possibility of the construction of alternative greater uh, Eastern Europe project that shouldn't be uh, anti-European or uh, anti-Western, -West, uh, but uh, that could insist on some particularity. Okay, and let me follow up on maybe, that project. Yes, yes, and maybe Austrian, uh, uh, Austria could return with Hungary and maybe for, with other Eastern European countries to recreate great space of, of great space of Austro-Hungarian Empire. Okay, Ivan Krastev, do you think the West has anything to fear from a potential Eurasian Empire that includes some of the countries that we just listed? Listen, first, I do believe that Russia, like every other country, has the right of the integration project. So if they have a soft power and if they can attract state and societies to join them, welcome. So from this point of view, I don't have any problem with the Eurasian Union in the way it is now, or it could be, if this is based on a free choice and basically if societies go there. But the problem with this proposal is that at this moment, I cannot see what is the model on the base of which... Uh, Russia is going to attract all these countries. I'm now staying in Austria, being Bulgarian and so on. And listen, I don't see any Austrian which is very much interested to join the Eurasian Union. You can say that basically Russia now looks as a great power, but Russia is very much one person. When you talk about institutions that uh, basically uh, Mr. Fukuyama started his talk about, strangely enough, uh, Mr. Putin is not creating an institutions. Neither the United Russia, even the presidency, basically, is not an institution that you can easily imagine after Putin. So from this point of view, till now, the major soft power coming from Russia is cheap resources. You can see Mr. Orban bargaining that he's going to get 10 billion from Gazprom for this or that. You can see different Western politicians being very much interested in this. But I don't believe this is the soft power on the base of which you can create a Eurasian Union, which is going to be something more than basically uh, uh, a business deals there. So from this point of view, I do believe European Union has its own problems, but I don't see the promise of the Eurasian Union as the thing that is going to destabilize it. Francis Fukuyama, am I right in saying that you were once a student of Samuel Huntington's? Uh, that's right, I was. You were. Okay, so uh, and we, we actually had him on this program once upon a time talking about his clash of civilizations, uh, which of course has been the subject of so much conversation. And I wonder whether you think that clash of civilizations is happening uh, between Russia and Ukraine right now. Uh, well, you know, I... I was uh, a student and owe a lot to Sam Huntington. I didn't like that book. I wrote a critical review of it in the Wall Street Journal, and uh, we had a slightly tense moment uh, in our relationship uh, after that. Uh, but it's for the exact same reason that I disagree with Mr. Dugan, that yeah, there are cultural differences. They can be very deep and abiding, but they're also integrative uh, uh, forces that operate in the world, and therefore, uh, you know, there, and, and societies are divided and cultures change. And so therefore, it does seem to me that there is a basis for uh, things like, uh, uh, like universal values uh, uh, to exist. Uh, and I, you know, th there are parts of the world where it's more applicable. So the only part of the world that really thinks of itself as a civilization is, uh, you know, is the Middle East where there's a concept of a Muslim ummah. The idea that Ukraine and Russia are 
somehow part of separate civilizations is, well, in fact, I, I suspect Mr. Dugan's argument is they're part of the same civilization and that mm -hmm. it's basically a, a Russian one. But both of these societies are divided internally. You know, they're, they're divided in terms of values and the kinds of institutions that uh, people uh, prefer. And so I think it's completely unhelpful uh, to see that conflict in cultural terms. It's really a combination of internal politics exacerbated by a lot of external uh, uh, interference right now. Okay, let me put the question somewhat differently then. Do we Western Democrats love our way of organizing society and our democracy so much that we're prepared to do clearly more than we have already done, which many would argue is not very much at all, in order to try to get Ukraine to be part of us? Well, I think, yes, there's a moral uh, obligation to support people that want to be self-determining, uh, but there's also a larger principle at stake. The post-1991 European settlement uh, was based on the idea that Russians that are stranded outside of Russia would stay in place and that everybody would figure out how to live peacefully uh, in that kind of a situation. And Mr. Putin has thrown that principle out the window. He's basically told all these Russian populations, if you're unhappy, uh, we're going to come to your support. And that is going to destabilize many countries well beyond, uh, well beyond Ukraine. Uh, and so I think that you know, I, I guess the one thing that makes me a little bit more relaxed about this is that Russia is playing from an extremely weak hand right now. Uh, unlike China, which has actually developed a modern, high-tech, very diverse powerhouse economy, Russia is completely dependent on oil and gas uh, uh, for its economic growth. And because of the collapse of oil prices, it's, you know, it's going to go into a very severe recession. And so Mr. Putin is playing from a weak hand that I think ultimately is going to be very hard to sustain. But I do think that unless he is persuaded to pull back, the destabilization is not going to be limited to the Donbass. It's going to extend to Moldova and Kazakhstan and the Baltics and many other countries in that region. Ivan Krastyev, how do you see it? Listen, I, I basically see what's happening there very much as Russia's revolt against globalization. Uh, and I do believe that after 25 years of development, basically Russia does not see this type of economic results that it was expecting from this transition. And I very much agree that comparing Russia with China, basically, you can see that uh, China was doing much better. So from this point of view, I'm going to uh, try to read current Russian policy much more as aggressive isolationism than a classical imperial policy. Because the problem with the European order after 1989, and from this point of view, European order was different than the global order, was that we're not going to change borders. We're not going to exchange populations like after the World War II in order to secure borders. But we're going to change the nature of the borders. And I do believe that as a result of this, what we see is that Mr. Putin is not simply changing the borders with Crimea, but he's much more changing the nature of the border between Russia and uh, the West. Uh, in economic terms, it's very much going back uh, to kind of a self-sufficient economy, if this is possible. Uh, also, the way you have the movement of people and the ideas, this idea of the nationalization of the elites, I don't believe that Russia is going to gain much out of it. I agree very much that we cannot talk about civilizational wars between Ukraine and Russia. This is ridiculous in a way. Uh, but I do believe that you have two countries with a very difficult identity issues. Both in Ukraine and Russia, there was a very painful process of identity building after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And unfortunately, basically, now this type of a difficult identity building ended up in, in the war, which in my view is not going to benefit any other. But my principal position is that the West should not be interested in containing or isolating Russia. So from this point of view, strangely enough, I do believe some of the hoax in the West and Mr. Putin, basically they agree on something. They totally want to make the Russia between the border between Russia and the West as a kind of a wall. This time the wall is not going to be built by the Russians, it's going to be built by the Ukrainians. And I don't like it because in a certain way, what started with 1989 was not simply building new walls. The idea was uh, to ruin the walls. Hmm. Gentlemen, we have just a few minutes left and I'd like to raise one more issue. And Alexander Dugan, I'll start with you on this. Uh, as we see Western countries putting increasing sanctions on Russia because of Ukraine, we are reminded of many things, but certainly one thing above all, 
and that is the great capacity of the Russian people to suffer. Uh, we know well in the West of the incredible amount of suffering that the Russian people endured during World War II. And I would just like to ask Mr. Dugan to help us understand where this great capacity for suffering comes from. So, from the point of view of uh, the liberal anthropology uh, expressed, for example, in Jeremy Bentham, uh, the human being naturally avoids suffering. But it is maybe Anglo-Saxon human being avoids necessary suffering. But uh, in the Christian culture, uh, in Russian culture, Russian people is very deeply Christian. Suffering is a kind of the way of the salvation of the soul. So for us, suffering for the ra right cause is a kind of um, the dignity and the form of uh, to accept human destiny because the life is suffering. So for us, sanctions um, against us only consolidate our society because we feel that we are suffering not for the stupidity or weakness of our uh, president or our uh, government, but we are suffering for defending rights cause against uh, any um, temptation to impose on us some uh, foreign will, some set of values that we uh, refuse. So for us, it is a kind of sacred suffering. And I think that sanctions help to our society to come to our, to return to our sources. I see these sanctions very positively because they help to us to rely upon uh, our proper resources, upon our proper forces, to evaluate better our identity. And I agree with Mr. Krastev uh, uh, concerning uh, the um, fragility of the Putin's rule uh, in the absence of the uh, institutions. So it is very, very dangerous to Putin to, uh, to, to play this game he is now playing without institutional reforms. Uh, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is very uh, true. Uh, but I think that he now he is obliged um, to, to create some institutions in order to uh, confirm this course that he has resolutely um, uh, taken, uh, chosen, uh, in order to um, affirm uh, Russian sovereignty against uh, this kind of imposition of foreign will that uh, was in Ukraine. So we consider uh, the pressure against us, uh, against Russia, against Putin, against our economy as a, a, a kind of very important existential proof. We are proving now to be uh, to have dignity, to have sovereignty, and we are suffering for the right, uh, right uh, case. That is very, very interesting that now I am in solidarity with our opponent, uh, opponents in the West, and I would applaud more uh, sanctions against Russia because they help very much to us mm. to return to our identity and to reaffirm our, our job political independence and freedom. Let me get Ivan Krastyev to uh, respond to that by asking whether you think Vladimir Putin is counting on all of what Alexander Dugan just said in order to get through this crisis. No, I do believe that especially on short term this consolidation effect is there. But what uh, the Russian population so much liked about uh, uh, the annexation of Crimea was that Crimea was annexed and there was no uh, human victims. Nobody died for this. Uh, I do believe that with the passing of time, and this is interesting to see, to what extent the Russian population is going to agree to pay the bill for this policy, especially, and here I do believe Mr. Dugin is going to agree with me, if they see that the Russian elites are as corrupt as they used to be before, so they ask from the people to sacrifice, and you know now uh, Prime Minister Medvedev said that uh, medicines are going 20% up. For people, it matters. 
Uh, when you see this type of a corrupt elites which are telling the people you should suffer in the name of the Russia's glory, I do believe that this is not a recipe for a long-term consolidation. And from this point of view, I also very much agree with the problem of the institutions. I do believe that Mr. Putin for sure is a strong leader. He decided, he showed uh, his capacity to take risks and to stay on certain positions, but he was not for the moment managed to be an institution builder, which makes him very different than uh, other people in history that he probably compare himself with. So this combination between weak institution and the corrupt elites, I don't believe that in the long run, the sanctions are going to have such a positive role for the Russian identity as Mr. Dugin believes. Francis Fukuyama, let me give you the last word on this. Well, I think that uh, there's also a foreign policy dimension to this, which uh, you know is important uh, to you know uphold the certain principles about the way that states uh, interact and to you know lay down um, certain markers. So I think that it's not simply a question of how this is going to affect uh, Russia's internal uh, evolution, but I do think that. You know, one thing uh, that I, I really agree with, it's really important uh, to actually, for the West to actually support the Russian people. Russia is not Vladimir Putin. Uh, Russia is a much more complicated society. Uh, and it's not clear, given the personal basis of uh, his rule, uh, what kind of society is going to come uh, after uh, he's gone from the scene. Uh, and therefore, it does seem to me that it's probably important to build uh, bridges uh, perhaps not with this elite necessarily, but with uh, ordinary people that are uh, actually going to be the ones that will continue to live and you know, uh, uh, suffer uh, and exist uh, under uh, the, the, the political conditions that Putin has created. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for spending so much time with us here on TVO tonight. It was really a marvelous discussion. Our thanks go out to Alexander Dugan, the Russian philosopher and political activist. His latest is called Eurasian Mission, an Introduction to Neo-Eurasianism. Ivan Krasyev, the chairman of the Center for the Liberal St uh, Strategies in Sofia, permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. Democracy Disrupted, the Politics of Global Protest is his latest. And Francis Fukuyama, the senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies at Stanford. Political order and political decay is his latest. Gentlemen, a great pleasure having you on TVO tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.